Okay. Now, so so far the death rate in the population is about 100%. Okay. So, it makes sense that we should have some idea of what we need to do when somebody passes away. That make, does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So, we need to notify the relatives, employers, friends, who's, who's, in our, who's interested? Clergy, rabbis, you know, priests, whatever. Okay? We need to determine if there's an autopsy or organ donation issues. Do we have any organ donors here? Yeah. I think you become an organ donor. On my license? It's on your license, right? And, yeah. and so it, oh, it's it, in my will, too. Uh, it's in your will. Or, that will be yeah. really helpful in your will. <coughs> or I don't know, some directive. It's, it's somewhere written down. <laughs> yeah. Specificity is overwhelming. So you became an organ donor by you, you, you check the box and you sign the thing and now you got a little hard on your on your driver's license, right? So there's a lot of direction about what pieces and parts you want to give off and for what purposes. And, and who was supposed to make the decision, right? No, there's none at all. Okay. And so, and these things you don't you don't put these kind of things in your will because by the time the will is found and submitted to the probate court and approved, you're going to be pretty moldy. Okay? I think that has an impact on your desirability as an organ donor. Okay. So we need to do it outside of that. So I'm sure it's not in your will. Okay. I did something though. My health care directive. It could be. It's very specific. Yeah. Uh, we need to find the will. Uh, you should, I believe, you should talk to an attorney because one of the clerks in the probate court try and be helpful. They cannot give you legal advice. And my experience is sometimes when they do break that rule, they don't give you very good advice. Right? But they're always well-intentioned. They, they, most of them, there's some personalities where they're just cranky, and, but mostly they try to be helpful. Okay? You need to find out what all the assets are, and ultimately you have to determine the data value. Okay? Now, if we have everything in a trust, what do we need to do? You need to notify relatives of what clergy. You need to just catch. You you just you, you have to get the trust. You have to do all these same things, whether you're doing it with a will or a trust. Okay. We're going to donate. We have some details on that. You should. Did we get a statute? You can say who makes the decision. You can spell this out very clearly. Um, what, what your wishes are. I think, because I have some clients who are very good, they're more than happy to donate organs if it's going to help extend somebody's life, alleviate a serious illness, but they're not really interested in having the brain examined for research. Okay? They are, so, Others say, you know, if I can help society in general, they can do anything they want with my remains. Okay? Uh, I could tell you a story about the first guy who left his whole body in the Yukon, but I don't have time. Uh, we've got, you can, you can get registered on registries, if you've got a, Turn along so you can communicate. The, the thing is that you, if you want to do this, I, I encourage you to think you know, more holistically about really what you want. Okay? There's, because there's no right or wrong here. Okay? You can, you can be like the guy who said, you can have my whole body, but I want my gold teeth back. That's for real. Okay? Uh, You can have and allow your health care representative to make these instructions unless you prohibit it. 
I think it should be explicitly provided for. That's probably where you've got some instructions. Okay. You, you said you had stuff on organ donation, mm -hmm. probably in your health care. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the parent of an unemancipated minor can do it. Okay. Uh, the guardian of a minor can. So if you haven't spelled out who's going to do it, the law does have an order of whom the doctors are supposed to talk to. I just think this is, a kind of, again, kind of a big deal. Maybe we should think about it, talk to who's responsible, tell them what, tell them what you want. Okay. Uh, I'm happy to give up my corneas, but I want to keep everything else. Okay. Uh, you can always amend or revoke the gift. Well, once they, once they left the hospital, it's kind of hard to find out the end of it. So, uh, so you can destroy it uh, if it was, and I, I, I firmly believe that making a gift in the will makes no sense, okay? Uh, and so however you amend or revoke it doesn't make any sense because uh, you just do it because it doesn't matter in the will because nobody's going to see it in time. Uh, autopsy, that's big. That can be a big deal in some families. Uh, the state medical examiner always has a right to conduct an autopsy if there's, if there's a violent crime or other similar incident involved. Okay? The, the, otherwise, we have to get the consent of the family to do it. Okay? Uh, and there they would go to the health care representative. Okay? Oh, uh, it, it, one of the things that I think should consider doing is any time you have somebody uh, where it's not an intact nuclear family, okay? if there's any, you've got, you know, uh, second, second wife, second husband, you've got his kids, her kids, our kids, you've got, you've got the now traditional American family, okay? <laughs> It's a good idea to have uh, a custody of remains uh, document done in, that says this is who I want to decide what happens with me. Okay? That will alleviate a lot of hassle because this is, you know, the first time I heard about somebody being in probate court fighting about who had custody of the remains, I said, you've got to be kidding me. But it happens. Uh, so you want to try and spell that out, okay? Now, so the next step, we, we've gotten through the initial, the very initial phase of this whole thing. You've passed away, and now what do we do, okay? We want to try and do this so we don't feel like everything is dropping into this never-ending black hole. Uh, which is what most people, one of the biggest complaints about probate is how long it takes. One of the biggest complaints about selling a trust is I never knew I had to do this. Okay? Those trusts don't magically do things. They don't grow legs running around and they never make phone calls to the bankers or see the broker. Or, okay? So we're going to walk through what we think are fairly clearly delineated steps that need to be done. You have to understand, and we teach a three-hour course called the Successor Trustee Training Class for our clients and our families to help teach them some of this that I'm going to go over you know, fairly lightly with you today. Okay? Uh, we always have to know who's going to be responsible to do things. So, we talked about, I've had questions about ownership. Ownership and beneficiary designations may determine what path we're going to follow. Okay? For, for assets that are owned solely in the name of the deceased, we're going to either use a will in the probate process, or we're going to use the probate process and 
an intestate process through the probate court. Okay? <coughs> For assets that pass by beneficiary designation, and, and somebody's asked about transfer on death. Uh, in, in, in trust for uh, in POD, payable on death. Those are just very limited statutory forms of beneficiary designations. Okay? They don't give you much flexibility. Okay? Those assets are going to pass outside of probate. Okay? Jointly owned assets pass outside of probate. If you have a contract that says, you know, Joe Dokes gets exit, you know, my death, then that can control what happens. See, essentially, for the most part, probate is there to help make sure that the stuff of the decedent is properly taxed, that the creditors of the decedent get paid, and when we get through all of that, then we get the stuff wherever they said they wanted it to go, unless you have a statute that says it can't go there. Okay. And that's been the way probate is since Henry VIII gave it to us. He did something besides cut his wife's heads off. Okay. Uh, assets that are in trust don't get involved with probate. Now, but here's I'm talking about the probate process and people confuse that with the expense of probate. Okay? In Connecticut, we're going to pay the probate court exactly the same whether you use a trust or a will, assuming that we don't have litigation. If we have litigation, then we may pay the probate court quite a bit more, depending upon because I do think it is easier to defend a trust than it is a will. Okay? And when we see less trust litigation than will based litigation. Okay? So, so here, here are the steps. Okay? First step is really before it matured. That's all the planning different stuff we've been talking about. We then have to see that we get appropriate authority for the people who are, who are going to act. We have to make sure they've got control of it. We then have to essentially do the things that need to be done. We're going to have to have inventories, appraisals. <coughs> uh, we've got to deal with creditors. We're going to have estate tax returns. We're going to have to do accountings. And then we have to do distributions. Now, does anybody here have a revocable trust? Anybody? One, two, three, four, few of you. Okay. I'm no, working on one. You're working on one. Okay. Well, you have to do the same things if you have a trust. The, the, the big expense that people have heard about with probate, and Larry's talking about a workshop they went to talk, uh, talking about that. I'm, I'm not talking too far out of school, okay? Is you have to do all the same things. And in Connecticut, the probate court gets paid exactly the same. So the question really becomes more about which is going to help make my plan most effective. Okay. Now, you have, you have to do planning. Now, almost all estate planning fails. I told you I've been doing this for 40 years, right? Well, that kind of screws up by being 27, doesn't it? Uh, I see some like, why? Okay. Here's why, because everybody thinks it's about getting documents. Okay. And I didn't get your name, sir. It's all back by the, you asked about funding. John. John. John brought up the question about funding. And I talked about alignment. One of the reasons that almost all estate plans fail is because people think it's about going and seeing an attorney and getting some pieces of paper with black letters on it. Then it, and that it's going to be titled will or trust or maybe both. If you don't take the time, it, and it's harder than it sounds, but you have to align all the beneficiary designations and all the ownership of your assets with the plan you've chosen. If you don't do that, 
it's not going to produce the results you want. I have a client who's an attorney. He is kind of a partner in the world's largest law firm. They have 6,500 attorneys. I can't imagine. Okay. And you no, know, if we went to that firm and we got their most expensive, most talented guru of estate planning from that law firm, and they drafted the plan and they put it on gold foil with silver ink. If you don't do the next step of making your assets, ownership, and beneficiary designations align up with that plan, it is not going to produce the results you intended. I don't understand. I don't understand what that means. Okay. Well, let me try this. A will only controls those assets that you own in your own name. Right. That's it. Nothing else. A trust only controls that which is owned by the trustee. Beneficiary designations only go where you point them, and unless somebody helped you understand how to name, name a trust, whether it's under a will or a revocable trust or an irrevocable trust of beneficiary, it will probably get messed up. I, I'm not as pessimistic as it sounds, but I've been doing this long enough that I know that without help, most people don't get it right. And if they do get it right, things change. I had a friend in Ohio, for instance, a recovering engineer, and he kept track of for years how old the documents were people were bringing into him. And he figured out that on, that on average the documents were 19.6 years old. I think it's 20, but he's re still recovering. Okay? Now, how much change has there been in the law? in your health and, and your relationships in the health and relationships of those you care about over 20 years. Huge. And, and so if on average plans don't get, don't get revisited for 20 years, if anything happens in that 20 year time frame, it's going to produce an unintended result. It's like guaranteed. I spent 20 years trying to figure out how to focus on the results as opposed to merely delivering documents. And if I think if I'd known how hard it was going to be, I don't know if I would have changed. Because it it's a never it's a never ending process to try and figure out the best ways to help people do things, to get the results they want. Okay? So you got to understand, we want to be sure that the executors and trustees understand their responsibilities. Some of you may have been executors or trustees. Did anybody really explain to you what you were getting into? Right? And what, because there, there are some downsides to being an executor or, responsible, or a successor trustee. You need to understand that. Okay? Obtain authority. With a will is relatively, you got the, the, did I walk through how we get authority no. under a will? File on the will, notify the beneficiaries, uh, as well as interested parties. Invite, literally invite them in to file a will contest. The court ultimately decides, well if it's a trust, so this is where a trust is much more efficient, is we look at it to see what it says to do to give authority to a successor trustee, and you do that. Typically, we can get that done in a couple hours' time, you know, maybe a little longer. Okay? We need to be sure that we understand. We have to actually read the document to understand everything we need to do, and you need to do that up front. In part, so you help the individual who's assuming these responsibilities decide whether I want to do it or not, okay? But also so that they can act appropriately. So there, there a lot of times you'll see stuff talking about fiduciary liability. That's executors and trustees and fiduciaries. By and large, fiduciaries don't get in trouble if they just follow the rules. And most people.
tangible benefit from somebody working with somebody who does this stuff all the time because just because attorneys think it's clear when they write it doesn't mean it is when a lay person reads it a year or five or twenty years later. Uh, so trust easy probate that's the process we go through. And oh, by the way, if you have, if you own real property in more than one state, so like you live here in Connecticut and you got a place up on the Cape, if it's in your own name, not only do we have to deal with probate here, but we got to deal with it up there. And if the state's large enough, we have to pay a state tax to Massachusetts that in part is based on how, how big your state is down here. Okay? And, and so it depends on it depends on where this is, where the state's located. Okay. So you got to comply with the terms of the trust or the will, and okay. you you have to comply with the law relating to the trust and wills. Okay. And by the way, the shorter the trust, the more you have to know about the will. I mean, know about the law. Same thing with wills. The shorter, the shorter the document, the more you have to know about the law. Because the shorter it is, the less instructions can be in it. You, fundamentally, one of the ways you stay out of trouble as an executor or, or trust, successor trustee is you treat everybody fairly. You follow the rules as laid out, and you be fair, and you, be, and you communicate with them on a regular basis about what's going on. Okay. You got it. Their tax requirements, their tax issues with, with both wills, with the states, and with trusts. Okay. We've got a lot more control about the tax issues with trusts than we do with, with wills. Uh, we have to make sure that we keep all the assets separate from your assets. You have to take control of them because you're responsible for what happens. Okay. You're going to have, if, there, if there's investable assets, you're going to have to invest them, you're going to have to manage them, you have to make decisions about this. Uh, you're going to have to keep good, good records. And we suggest that you are going to do a, an accounting to the beneficiaries, even if the trust excuses it, because you get in trouble by not telling people stuff because then they don't trust you. Okay. Um, you don't secure valuables. Don't leave the gold bars laying on the dining room table. Okay. Don't leave the jewelry in the case in the bedroom where everybody knew where it was. Okay. It won't be there. I can't tell you how many times I've seen Jewelry just walk, get up and walk out of the house, and nobody knew how it happened. Okay? Change the locks if you got real estate. Okay? Lock up the house. Uh, and I say invest assets appropriately. Tell me, you have two choices. You can apologize for not making a lot of money, or you can make up what was lost out of your own pocket. Which do you prefer? <coughs> you apologize. He's saying that there's, is this a trick question? I mean, this is like a no-brainer. Why did this moron up here be asking that question? Of course, I'm happy to apologize. Yeah? Well, here's the thing. One of the places where executors and trustees run into trouble is they don't take this responsibility seriously. Uh, they're busy, what have you. And well, let's let's say you became the executor or trustee, and and there was a million dollars in the account in the fall of 2008, and you had to do an accounting for the beneficiaries in the spring of 2009 and you just left everything set there just the way it was, what would have happened? You would have lost a lot of money probably. Was that your fault? Yes. Yes, it was. Who said yes? It's absolutely your fault because you're now responsible. Just because 
just because dad kept 100% of his investment in GE stock, doesn't mean you can. And if it go, and I pick on GE because GE never has never come back. Okay, it's ten years later and still never come back. Okay, that's a pretty bad outcome. Was it prudent to leave everything in GEs? Would you think that's reasonable? Yeah, wasn't well, reasonable was that was doing it, but that was his money, and he's the one who suffers a loss. Okay, so you have to think about that. Okay. Uh, we need to do an inventory. You gotta know what you have, and to be able to tell some anybody else what you have, you have to put it on paper. There's a there's a formal approach to be doing it, but it's not that bad. The trustee needs to know it. You got the difference here is that inventory is for your purposes and the beneficiaries, and over here is for your purposes and the beneficiaries and the courts. Okay. Personal property, you need to identify the personal property as soon as possible. You need to, and part of what you're going to be doing is you're going through looking at it and trying to figure out, you're in part deciding do we actually need to get any of this stuff appraised and valued to be able to deal with the, the taxes and account to the beneficiaries for what we really have. Okay. So banks. You, 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 there's a number of steps you have to go through here. You need to uh, verify how the accounts are owned. Even if you have to determine the value as a date of death. You have to keep track of whatever interest accrues during the process until you physically have taken control of these funds. Okay? And even then you have to. Outstanding loans, you got to deal with that's the death. Safe deposit box. Safe deposit boxes, I like to see at the name of the trust because it's easy to go in and get in them because the banks are not supposed to let anybody into a safe deposit box that has a decedent as one of the owners until after this okay by the probate court and even then they're supposed to supervise the taking of the assets. If it's in the name of the trust, pretty easy. So by the way, don't lose the key. Okay? Don't give, and even worse, don't give the key to somebody who is going to jerk you around for months by giving it back to you. Okay? If there's credit unions, a lot of credit union accounts have insurance to go with them. Uh, brokerage accounts, same thing. Uh, we're going to have to do, ultimately, we're going to have to do change of ownership on all of these accounts. IRAs, we have to verify who the beneficiaries are. <coughs> you're not a, if you're the guy doing this, you want to get the designation that's on record with the company before you just, before you have anything sent to anybody, before any claim forms are filed. Because some and you gotta be careful with this, because sometimes when you file a claim on an IRA, they will send you a check for the whole thing. And that's not what you want usually <coughs> if you're the beneficiary. Huge negative in income tax consequences. Uh, pensions, there, we got to figure out is anything going on to anybody else? And what was this account worth as of the date the decedent died? Because $1,000 a month for the rest of mom's life has a determinable value. Right? But you have to know what's going to mom. And until you know who it's going to, you can't begin to figure out what it's worth. And sometimes you can get the companies to do this for you, and other times you can't. Okay. okay. We talked about final risk. We actually go back to 2003, which seems like ancient history at this point. But we have an opportunity if we have beneficiaries named on an IRA that causes tax problems. This is not a class on IRAs and all the issues that are there. But we have an opportunity until September September 30th of the year following the year of death to fix any problems we have with beneficiary designations 
that could produce a bad income tax result. The biggest one of which is may having a charity name as a beneficiary. You got to identify that, get them paid out. Okay. Uh, if 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 from a planning standpoint, if you have significant retirement plan accounts and significance relative, I've had folks with this, with, with hundred thousand dollars do this. I've never had anybody with less than that end up create a trust that's specifically designed to create the best possible protection for their beneficiaries with the IRA benefits is payable to them. Because remember I told you earlier, you never take a penny out of a retirement plan account to pay a creditor? Well, and that's because it's protected, nobody can take it away from you? But once it goes to a, a beneficiary, it can be taken away from them? So you want some, and a lot of folks want to consider a separate trust just for that because of the income tax issues that we want to be sure we manage well. Insurance, confirm the beneficiaries, get the data enough values. It's a form the IRS tells insurance companies they have to send. They now frequently send it as part of the check. And of course, you've got to file the claim form. Okay? Asset appraisals. Because we have to file an estate tax return, because many of these assets are going to be sold, we have to know what their value is for income tax purposes so we know how much we can get and not pay tax on it for income tax purposes. Okay? So, car is pretty easy to get. Real estate, limited partnerships, LLCs, that kind of thing, business interest much more difficult to value and there are a lot more issues in terms of the valuation process that we have to deal with. Uh, we may need to hire an appraiser to value some of the personal property. We're just in the process of winding up in a state where dad bought stuff from Europe and Africa by the car load and resold, resold most of it but some of it he kept and it happens to be very interesting artifacts and art and it was it was a really interesting challenge to find people who could appraise some of this stuff because the daughter you know knew dad had always done this had no idea what it was worth it could be worth a lot of money um, you have to you have to plan for their, their expenses are going to have to be paid you need to plan for the cash okay um, there can't, depending upon how things are arranged, we may have to get two, three, four, half a dozen tax ID numbers depending upon the nature of the planning. At, at a minimum, we always have to get one. Generally, we have to get more. Uh, because the estate becomes a tax paying entity. If you have a revocable trust, it's a tax paying entity. If you have an irrevocable trust that was at a tax paying entity during a lifetime, it is now. Okay. And sometimes we have to do advanced plan to solve liquidity issues because sometimes people have assets and they don't have cash. So how are we going to solve that problem? We have to tell we have to notify the creditors and this should be done whether whether you, in my opinion, whether you are doing a will as a will-based or a trust-based estate, because if you're the executor or you're the successor trustee, you want to be sure that you know who all the creditors are so you can figure out are these people I should pay or not pay. In some cases, you're going to elect to not pay them but you have to know who they are, and so you got to give them notice. If you give them notice under, under the will provisions, and they, never, they don't come forward, there's a good chance that you'll never have to pay them. Uh, if, if they do come forward, then you have an opportunity under the will to the probate court to say, you know what, I don't believe I own them. I think we only owe this. Uh, and ultimately the court can decide to vote <coughs> in our practices. 
we're fairly good at negotiating something with the creditors that the client thinks they shouldn't pay, that they find reasonable. Um, we have to do an estate tax return. The Connecticut has two forms, the Connecticut 706NT, which by its very name says we know there's no estate tax due, NT means non-taxable. Uh, but we file it, we file it with the probate court, and this says above 2 million, it's actually 2.6 this year. The slide I missed updated. And if, if you're above 2.6 million, then we're going to have to file a full 706. The 706NT is, is a little simpler, but is filed with the probate court. And literally, if we if it is a tax only probate, they look at it and say, oh, based on this, our fee is Y, and they send a bill. And that's all they do. And that can be the limit of your involvement with the probate court, but you will have at least that much. Okay, no matter what you do. Um, Probate court fees. Uh, <coughs> we say half a point over everything above two million. This slide is out of date, unfortunately. Uh, they capped it at probate fees uh, last year at forty thousand dollars. So the worst case for probate court to the fee to the probate court is forty thousand. Okay. Uh, they decided the folks that had those estates over. Is that eight million? <coughs> you know, that they just shouldn't have to pay any more to the probate court than that. Uh, if you, and you probably don't have many clients like this, that they're spending time in the big state of Florida, they spend a lot of time in Florida until they claim they're a Florida resident. Mm -hmm. Okay. If they own real estate here, then whether they're using a, a trust or a will as their planning device, they're going to have to file, your executor's going to have to file under penalty of perjury a form C3, which is the Declaration of Domicile. And what they, they want to know, what country club did you belong to? What, what church or synagogue did you go to? Where are your cars registered? What, 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 what did I say country club? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It, it, it's three, it was five pages. They cut it down to three pages of those kinds of questions so the Department of Revenue can decide should they tax your whole estate or do they only get to tax what's in Connecticut. The better approach, I believe, is to make sure that you don't actually own real estate in Connecticut, but there's some planning techniques that don't require you to give up the Connecticut real estate. We just avoid this whole question because it's easier. You can't have dual residency. No. Well, you can end up. You can. It is possible. There's some tax cases out there where you end up having to pay both state taxes. Is that what you mean by dual residency? You want to pay more state tax? No, no, you're, you're going to be one or the other for these purposes. Okay? Uh, the estate tax after January 1, 2014, you can see it used to, you know, 7.2, 2 million. Now it's, that's 2.6. Next year it'll be at 3.6. And in 2020 it's supposed to match the feds, but they have provisions in the statute that they've got to do something to fix it because it's got limitations that don't match what the federal law is. Okay. Well, they, they, they passed the law last October as part of the budget deal, and they didn't know that the feds were going to change the federal taxes in December, and they just haven't come back and fixed it. Massachusetts, they have a million dollar threshold for a state tax. And so if, if you've got folks who own places in Massachusetts, or we see folks who've got places out on the Cape and whatever, and it's not about having a million dollars in Massachusetts, because in Massachusetts we have to file an old federal seven, a state tax return, and it tells them 
what you have everywhere, everything, and they use the total value reported on that return to determine where you come into the tax table in Massachusetts. So they tax whatever's in Massachusetts at the maximum possible Massachusetts <coughs> state tax rate. And again, that's avoidable with a little bit of planning. Okay? Uh, 2017, we said it was going to go to 5.4, it's down 11.2. Oh, I, I talked about one reason why estate plans fail, which was you don't get all the assets aligned. The other problem is this stuff. You plan based on what, you, what the rules are when you do the plan, and they keep changing. Sometimes they're minor, sometimes they're major, uh, and sometimes you have changes in your situation that because of changes in the law since you did it, you now have different results that you never intended. We have, for a long time, used a planning strategy to make sure that we minimize the income tax impact from the estate tax planning that might have been done. And we also minimize the income tax consequences of the planning. It's called a Clayton election. I think this time of the day, you probably know now more about Clayton elections than you want, but existing planning frequently creates problems because it doesn't encounter, uh, didn't anticipate the changes in the law. We need to do accounting. So accounting's are really saying, okay, we had this money come in, and we had this money go out, and here's what's left. That's all our accounting is. You just have to, it's just a detailed recitation of both income, where it came from, and how much it was, and where it went where it went, you know, most expenses, it could be distributions, and you got to do the same thing in probate, except, you know, probate you're filing with the court, and all the beneficiaries, you know, get copies, okay? Now, we say the probate court have jurisdiction over trusts. There's a statute, I can't remember now when it was passed in the 90s, that made it clear that the probate court can't take jurisdiction over a revocable living trust. Occasionally they do, but it's usually only when there's a dispute among either the trustees or the beneficiaries or both. Okay. Uh, distributions, you know, trusts are fairly, a lot of times they're going, to, they're going to provide specific distributions. They're going to say so-and-so gets so much or so-and-so gets this, this asset. You know, uh, there'll be provisions for what happens with that which is not specifically distributed, and, and it may be either outright or it may be held in subtrust or part of the trust that was created to start with. Probate mostly, well, we see probate as specific requests and outright distributions. Uh, we will get from the probate court a certificate of advice that says here's the stuff you're supposed to do and that you did and that you've done it. Okay. Uh, one of the places where we see trust under wills is when we're doing uh, Medicaid planning for the benefit of the surviving spouse. We will create a trust under the will for his or her benefit so that we don't lose anything. Uh, the distributions are a number of different patterns that we see flowing, marital trust, uh, that's providing for the surviving spouse. Family trust typically is providing for the surviving spouse and others. Uh, we can have language that pushes the, the allocation either way, depending upon your preference. We, and for most clients, when they understand the benefit of leaving assets in trust for a child, then we may well have trust shares for each of the children that may continue for the rest of their life so nobody can take away from them what they've been left. Uh, disclaimers. There's, there's some things we can do after you pass to try and, and get things where we want them. One of that is a disclaimer. It's literally a legal no thank you. It says, whatever I was getting, whether it's coming under, to you under a will or a trust, you say, treat me like I already dead, I already died, and whoever would have taken 
if I wasn't there, that's where it goes, mm -hmm. whether it's into a trust share or out to another individual. Uh, we, I'm not a big fan of disclaimers because we've got a lot of rules. We've got time frames that have got to be followed. And if we're relying on the, re the, the disclaimer to get a result, we have to make sure everybody understands the when and the how and what has to be done to make them work properly. Will contest. These are the things that cause Wills to be challenged. Lack of testamentary capacity. They just didn't know what they were signing. That's what that says. They, they, they didn't have enough capacity that they could enter into a will. Undue influence we've talked about. Lack of formalities. That you didn't get it properly witnessed. That, that, that is the big thing. It, wasn't, it was only partially signed. Uh, instrument revoked or superseded by a subsequent will. We had a case not too long ago that I guess it's actually several years where a fellow in his 90s decided that he did not want to pay an attorney to redo his will because he just wanted a few changes about who who got how much. And so he talked to his CPA who said, well, we'll watch you make the changes to your will. And then I and my assistant will give you a notarized affidavit that we saw you do it and it represents what you intended. And I'm sure it won't be a problem. He died. It was a problem. It took <coughs> five months to get the executor appointed. And the only way we got the executor appointed is we managed to convince the court that because they could still read what the original will said, that, and, and we got the family to sign off on this, they, they, they I don't remember what we call it, we call it a family agreement, but basically it was saying, yeah, okay, that's what dad wanted, we will go along with it. We actually had one of the family members who gave up uh, what would have been over $100,000 that would have come to him because he went along with this scheme. Um, because once you take and start marking up an existing will, that is deemed to be an effective revocation. So marking through it, you know, writing on it, initialing it, that's, that's not a modification, that's a revocation. Okay? If we had managed to you know, write lengthy memos and get the, uh, all the beneficiaries to agree with us and have a probate judge who wanted to be cooperative, uh, we would have had a 90-some-year-old nine Contestate, even though for the you know, majority of adult life, he always had a right? So you, you've got to respect those formalities, okay? You've got to do it right. 